Welcome to our lesson on testing claims about means. In this lesson we're going to learn how we can run hypothesis tests that involve the mean of a sample, a single sample. We'll learn how to deal with two samples in later lessons. Part one of this lesson deals with the more realistic uh, situation where we do not know the standard deviation of the population. Right? It is not known. That's realistic. Uh, the second part is kind of the more unrealistic procedure uh, where sigma is known, where we actually know the standard deviation of the population. It's not impossible, but it's very rare. That's why we're going to start off with the one that's a little bit more common. Okay, when we don't know the standard deviation of the population, we have to use a t-test. And that means we have to build our uh, sampling distribution with a t distribution and just to remind you what that looks like this is our picture reminding you that the blue line is the standard normal curve and that the orange and red lines are the t curves that tend to get closer and closer to the blue curve as your sample size increases as before n equals sample size x bar still equals your sample mean and the mu sub x bar is just representing your population mean sometimes it's also just written as mu some requirements anytime you run an a hypothesis test you always have to make sure that the requirements are met otherwise you're basically computing an analysis on improper data and your results are going to be um, improper because of that first requirement is that you have to have a simple random sample that's a biggie um, and then you either have to make sure that the population you're sampling from is normally distributed or your sample size is greater than 30 because we don't know the standard deviation of our population we're doing a t-test and this is the uh, formula for the test statistic when we're doing a t you'll recognize this is very similar to the z that we've done before of x minus mu all over sigma over the square root of n remember that one and all that's changed now is we have s instead of sigma so um, these formulas are, are very similar uh, for all of these hypothesis testing when you run the test there really are two well there's three ways to check the third way is kind of silly, but the, the two main ways, you check p-values or you check critical values. Um, I tend to prefer p-values, so that's going to be the one I'm going to use most often when I run examples, but I'll show you how to do it both ways. Just to remind us some of the important properties of the t-distribution, that um, its size changes, right? Every time the sample size goes up, as we saw in this slide, Additionally, um, the t distribution is very similar to the normal distribution in that it has that general bell shape. Right? It's uh, wider at the sides, which means it has greater variability. Um, the t distribution still has a mean of zero. And instead of having the standard deviation of one, like the standard normal curve, uh, its standard deviation varies with the sample size. So it starts off bigger than one and it shrinks down as your sample size gets larger. Let's look at an example. So listed below are 11 measured radiation emissions in a watts per kilogram corresponding to a sample of cell phones. We're going to use a, a 0.05 level of significance, i.e. that's our alpha, to test the claim that cell phones have a mean radiation level that is less than one watt per kilogram. Now you can do this yourself. You can stick all those numbers into your calculator or stat crunch or whatever and, and get the summaries, but I've done it here for you. We have an, a sample mean of 0.938 and a standard deviation of 0 0.423. Now we haven't talked about uh, this before, but we're claiming that the mean is less than one. If our sample mean wasn't even less than one, we would basically abandon that claim right off the bat. But since our sample mean is in fact less than one, at least on the surface, our data seems to support that claim. So then we can go ahead and move on and actually run the hypothesis test and see if it statistically supports the claim or not. 
First thing we have to do is uh, run our requirement check. So we're going to assume this is a simple random sample. Since our size is 11, which is smaller than 30, we need to make sure that we're um, sampling from a population that has a, a normal distribution. So we'd have to run a quantile plot, and this is a quantile plot of our points. We can see that the points are reasonably close to the straight line, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern. And so therefore, we're pretty safe in concluding that the data appear to come from a normally distributed population. So we can continue on with our hypothesis test. So let's start with our step one, where we need to identify the claim and write our hypotheses with their appropriate symbols. The claim was that cell phones have a mean radiation level less than one. So we would write that as mu being less than one. The alternative would be that mu is greater than or equal to 1. So most books would set up your uh, null hypothesis as strictly equal to, even though the opposite of your claim, right, the alternative to your claim is actually greater than. Um, it's becoming more and more uh, acceptable that, to actually use this symbol. So this secondary uh, null hypothesis is becoming more and more uh, acceptable but the one in blue is is kind of what traditionalists would use. Step two, select the significance level. Well, it was already stated that our significance level was going to be 0.05. Step three, we want to determine our sampling distribution and then calculate our test statistic and p-value. Well, because we don't know the population standard deviation, we have to use a t-distribution. So that's our sampling distribution. Then we can move on to calculating our test statistic and p-value. Here it is if we were going to do it by hand with the um, actual formula. We would get this as our test statistic. Remember, if, if we're asked for our test statistic, that's what this is, test statistic. Okay, And we would write, you know, T equals this because we want to make sure that people understand that this is a, a T and not a Z. Continuing on with step three, we would calculate our p-value either using um, technology or tables. We can get our p-value this way. Or, if we were going to do the critical value method instead of the p-value method, we would take that t-value that we got our test statistic from the previous slide. We would calculate the critical value, right, which we would call t-crit. This is often uh, kind of a shorthand t-crit would equal negative 1.812. We would draw ourselves a picture. This is all our rejection region over here because the test statistic that we got of negative 0.486 would land here. It's not inside the rejection region and we would fail to reject. The p-value method, which is a superior method because not only does it tell us whether or not we reject, but it gives us a better idea of the scale of that, right? 0.3 is a pretty big p-value, so not only do we fail to reject, but we pretty strongly fail to reject, right? This is a pretty common uh, number. Uh, 31, 32% is fairly common. So that's the reason why I like the p-value better. Uh, the p-value method better. And because our p-value method or our p-value is greater than 0.05, we fail to reject. So we get the same uh, result both ways. We move on to our fifth and final step where we want to uh, take our decision of failing to reject and word it in a non-technical way. So because we fail to reject null hypothesis, this means there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim that cell phones actually have a mean radiation level that is less than one watt per kilogram. And that's it for that example. Now I told you there was a third way. Besides the p-value method and the um, critical value method, there is the confidence interval method. I really don't like this method. It has its uh, problems uh, both in theory and in application. Um, I, I would not have you guys do this. I'm just going to mention it quickly in case you come across it uh, in a book that it does exist. The idea is you 
create a confidence interval around your um, sample data. So in this case, we got um, our sample mean. If we went back and used the techniques that we learned in estimating a population mean, we could create a confidence interval around it of basically 0.7 to 1.1. Because the value of 1.00 is within that confidence interval, we fail to reject the claim that it's less than 1, right? We would have to have an interval that was strictly less than 1, so it would have to go from like 0.7 up to 0.999 type of idea. That's what this is saying is because of the, that 1 is in the interval, we fail to reject, so we get that same uh, result this time. I really wouldn't do the confidence interval method if I was you. Okay, part two, the um, less common thing where we actually know the standard deviation of our population. It's very rare to actually know the population standard deviation but not know the population mean, right? And the whole reason why we're doing a hypothesis test is we're guessing, we're hypothesizing what the mean of the population is. So it's kind of a, a very rare, almost silly situation, but it does exist. So let's look at it. Everything is exactly the same, only now we're back to that z-score formula instead of the t-score formula. We still, you know, all the other steps are still the same. We write our null and alternative hypotheses, only now we'll... Um, be talking about z's instead of t's when we get to determining our distribution, right? So step one's the same, you write your null alternative. Step two is the same, you select your alpha level. Step three is the same, only now you're choosing a normal distribution with z's instead of the t distribution. You calculate your test statistic using this formula. And then from there on out, it's still the same. You either do the critical value method or the p-value method to determine whether or not you reject. In this case, I did the p-value method, got a p-value of 0.33, which if you remember from the pre previous example is pretty close to the p-value we had before, and that's because already with a sample size of 11, the t-distribution is already starting to get close to the z-distribution. And Because this p-value is bigger than our 0.05, again, we fail to reject. So same result. And that's it guys, that's um, you know, testing claims about a mean.